Later, he received his naturopathic medical degree in 1985 from Bastyr University in Seattle and completed postgraduate studies at the American Naturopathic College of Family Medicine in Phoenix, Arizona. Currently, he is an associate of Holistic Family Medicine Clinic in Tucson. The uh, clinic draws on natural alternative treatments developed throughout the world. Dr. Morris specializes in chronic and degenerative diseases, treating patients from all parts of the United States. Some of the therapies included are clinical nutrition, herbal medicine, med metabolic IV therapies, and alternative cancer therapies. He's past president of the Arizona Naturopathic Medical Association and a founding director and board member of the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Tempe, Arizona. He teaches basic and clinical sciences at the college and he's studied the clinics in Tijuana, including Gerson, Hoxie, Sedell, and American Biologics. Uh, let me introduce Lance Mars. Tucson to, to talk to you folks. Um, <clears throat> I had recently spoken at the uh, Cancer Control Society uh, conference about this topic, which is uh, specifically hyaluronic acid and um, vitamin C, parenteral application for cancer treatment. And, um, you know, I'm just curious in this group um, how many people are really familiar with naturopathic medicine, naturopathic physicians, versus merely alternative or integrative medicine. So, kind of third to maybe almost a half. Um, what's interesting is, is you may be aware that there's kind of a schism occurring in the um, integrative medical uh, paradigm. And that schism is between um, really uh, the old world, actually the new world allopathic mindset which is a very linear model for the treatment of disease. Um, it really goes back to um, the germ theory and the I ideology that you know, there is something external that invades the body, and that's the cause of disease. We're going to find a substance that will kill that thing, and voila, we have the uh, advent of modern medicine, which is now, for the first time in known history, a formal science. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that back in the, the, the 50s, the um, then Attorney General of the United States was talking to the United Nations and made the comment, now that we understand the cause of disease, i.e. microorganisms, and the cure of disease, i.e. primarily antibiotics, we believe within the next couple decades that we will see the total and complete eradication of disease on this planet. Aha! You know, it's like, yeah, okay. Um, now, it's interesting that you might all be aware that there is a new prevailing allopathic paradigm um, they're very excited about, um, and it has to do with genes. You know, we have mapped the human genome, and now that we've done that, by golly, that's really what the cause of disease is, and as we manipulate these genes, we are going to see the total and eradication, you know, of, of disease in the years to come. Um, from a broader integrative perspective, what's true is that um, the germ theory is correct. It's merely flawed because it's incomplete. And the gene theory is correct, but it's flawed because it's merely another piece of a bigger pie. Now, how big a piece of that pie we're going to discover that that is, is unclear at this time. Um, but naturopathic medicine is the discipline that's premise is, is predicated on the ideology that our, our life, our existence, our healing is an integration of mind, body, and spirit. And that from mind, body, and spirit, we have um, a variety of, of factors. And much of this is common sense, and candidly, it's stuff that you probably you know, all are aware of. But what's happening here, the schism that I was referring to at the beginning of, of this conversation, is that we are taking 
um, alternative medicine and trying to apply it in an allopathic way. Example, I'm depressed. I'm taking Prozac. Um, I'm wondering, could I take St. John's wort? You all have heard about St. John's wort, right? It's a nerve, and it's being used for depression, anxiety disorders. So what about that? Can I you know, stop my Prozac and, and, and take St. John's wort? And, and the answer is, well, maybe. Maybe you can. Is Prozac stopping the depression? Is it curing it? Is it fixing it? No, it's a palliative. It's suppressive. Is St. John's wort? healing or curing depression? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, it is palliative. But it's natural, and uh, we believe it has much less toxicity than a drug. And so if we can utilize that, it does make, it does make some sense that we might want to consider it. But um, all the time, uh, those of us that are practicing integrative medicine see patients come in who are looking for the natural quick fix versus the drug quick fix. Because that's the mindset that we've all been taught and indoctrinated um, into. And so um, the, a lot of my presentation is going to be kind of looking at this kind of linear allopathic perspective in which we take a disease. And it seems like I keep getting this up and down. So I move this thing. A little bit higher, maybe it'll be more consistently uh, uh, out there. So, <clears throat> so I kind of at the onset, I want to to warn everyone about the lin linear nature of this presentation, and that um, although I think the uh, evidence is quite exciting about um, using high doses of vitamin C for cancer combined with hyaluronic acid, why we may want to be considering this, that. Uh, I, and I and although I specialize in my clinical practice in chronic and degenerative disease and in particular in alternative cancer care, I do not believe there is a magic bullet for cancer. It does not make any sense based on my datropathic training and that is that healing is mind, body, and spirit and that you can't ignore those pieces and all the sub pieces that fit into it. You know, when we talk about alcohol poisoning and that you can use N-acetylcysteine to detoxify it so you can drink more, um, that is, that's really allopathic, you know? It's just this, it's this set of, well, okay, so we're gonna expose ourselves to carcinogenic substances, but we can, you know, do something and keep doing that, and it's like, aren't we clever? Because we understand some of the biochemistry here. Um, just as a minor point, um, there was no reference to probiotics in relationship to alcohol, and let me tell you, if you take high doses of probiotics, particularly lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus, um, it has a tremendous mitigating influence on the toxicity factors and will in most cases completely alleviate um, hangovers. So again, not that I am encouraging <laughs> such indulgences, but there's <laughs> another little, a little piece you can add in there. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do is um, talk about hyaluronic acid initially and then I want to uh, flip over into vitamin C and then I'm going to join the two together and, uh, and then share some case studies and then talk about kind of a, um, a, a broad-based kind of integrative um, treatment approach. Um, the, the issue here, uh, the fundamental issue that I think we need to be aware of is that in modern oncologic medicine that traditional therapy right now is primarily surgery, chemo, radiation. We know that chemotherapy and radiation are both very toxic. Very toxic to cancer cells, but unfortunately very toxic to healthy cells. Um, and the technology is improving, and yes, we have more focalized radiation therapies so that we're not indiscriminately destroying large zones of tissue, but we seem to have a problem with chemotherapy that we continue to be dominantly utilizing substances that are um, systemically toxic, that they are completely indiscriminate. Now again, because of some of the work um, with gene specificity, uh, it looks like we're maybe developing some modern technology to target, to create some targeting influence of a chemotherapeutic agent or, or a hormonal agent. Um, it scares me a lot because 
if we look at um, the consequences of gene manipulation in both plants and animals on this planet, and hybridization, and what's going on on a planetary basis in terms of the influence in our air, water, soil, and nutrition, I don't think that the long-term outcome is going to be to our benefit as a species on this planet. And I'm deeply concerned that our manipulating human genes um, in some clever ways is probably going to backfire on us as well. But, you know, there is some interesting research here. So, uh, the hyaluronic acid is an incredibly ubiquitous molecule um, in the human body. And basically, if you will, it's the glue that holds everything together. Um, so it's, it's, you know, the stuff that makes baby skin so wonderful and pliable. And it's the stuff that we lose as we age that starts to shrivel us up. So it has this profound affinity for um, holding water. And uh, you should all recall that we are mostly water. The human body is mostly water. And that a lot of the oxidative phenomenon that occurs in aging phenomenon is directly linked to the inability for the cells to hold, hold water together. Um, so uh, we see that um, hyaluronic acid is distributed mostly in the skin, then in muscles and skeleton, and then in joints, um, body fluids, blood and lymph. Basically, um, it has an important role in um, living cell communication and uh, obviously wound healing and anti-aging characteristics um, well, um, so the, the familiarity that most of us have with hyaluronic acid is, is actually a combination of glucosamine and glucuronic acid. Glucosamine, of course, is the molecule that has well, kind of become famous for treating rheumatic arthritic conditions and increasing um, you know, joint um, stability. Uh, but in fact, hyaluronic acid in this form is, in my opinion, much more potent than glucosamine as a substance uh, for joints. Um, and uh, you may be aware that there is, in fact, an allopathic medicine called Synvisc, which is hyaluronic acid that's injected primarily in the knees. And unfortunately, it's incredibly expensive. And doctors, for some reason, treat it like a steroid in the sense that they will only do it once or twice or very infrequently which is unfortunate because I've discovered that by taking low molecular weight hyaluronic acid and injecting that uh, perivertebrally in the spine, in the hips, in um, the knees, in any part of the body that is having an inflammatory or degenerative process that we increase collagen deposition and uh, decrease pain and improve function at quite a dramatic rate, uh, which we can also induce by merely taking it orally over time but we can really potentiate by using it um, injectably. Go ahead. So, hyaluronic acid holds water in the body, acts as a lubricant in the heart valves, shock absorber at the end of bones, moisture in the skin. You know, 80% of, uh, of the human eye. Uh, the original uh, uh, research where hyaluronic acid was discovered was actually with the eye. and. Interestingly, I've been using um, hyaluronic acid uh, as a solution with um, a microorganism called mucoracinosis um, combined with its trace amount of DMSO as an eye drop and have had tremendously positive results in reversing macular degeneration and stabilizing glaucoma and dissolving cataracts. Um, it's, it's, it's a very remarkable substance for many clinical applications. Um, you can see that it provides a barrier against infection and it retards the growth of cancer, although this is something that's somewhat controversial. Um, because hyaluronic acid or hyaluronin is inducing um, uh, this fundamental uh, substrate that, that all the cells are bathed in, we know the cancer cells produce both um, hyaluronidase and collagenase. It's one of the ways it breaks cells down and then spreads itself. So there has been some concern as to whether hyaluronic acid may in fact be helping to break 
the capsule and then in fact spread cancer. And um, in my experience clinically, if we're using, uh, certainly the form we use injectably is a low molecular rate, uh, low molecular weight hyaluronic acid. It does not do that. In fact, it acts as a modulating agent relative to the induction of hyaluronidase. Um, there? Okay. Thanks. So, go on. Um, so this, I, this, this idea that hyaluronic acid has an ability to intercept roaming cancer cells, that um, as cells metastasize, um, that we can hook the hyaluronic acid molecule to them, specifically if it's the low molecular weight um, form of hyaluronic acid. You know, the question is, does that in and of itself block or disrupt cancer cell proliferation, and it looks like the evidence suggests that it is. Um, we can see here that in, a, uh, in an animal model that 90 to 100% of the cancer cells were inhibited um, using this low molecular weight um, hyaluronic acid. So, um, yeah, go on. Um, Dr. Rudolf Falk, who is a Canadian oncologist, um, was one of the prime and first researchers to try to look at this fundamental question. And that is, um, since chemotherapeutic agents are so toxic and, and that the you know, cure may in fact be worse than the cause, how can we find a way to then take these toxic substances and create more tissue-specific targeting to cancer sites. And um, originally, he started doing research with DMSO. And if any of you have used DMSO, you know, it's an intriguing substance. I mean, put it on the ball of your foot, and sometimes within 30 seconds, you know, you have this funny, sulfury taste in your mouth, and then it kind of goes away, but anyone who gets near you Look, keeps looking around at what that smell is. <laughs> and it's kind of reminiscent of garlic, but it's not quite. It's kind of a sickly smell, and it doesn't go away easily. DMSO is a remarkable substance. It has a lot of clinical value, but it does have this one major untoward influence. And of course, as a carrier substrate, we know that DMSO is um, kind of a universal solvent. And anything you mix with it, it will then carry it into the body. Um, including across the blood-brain barrier and including any toxins. Um, and it carries whatever you mix it with indiscriminately through all the cells of the body. So there's no target specificity with DMSO. So although it is a very useful molecule, it's not exactly accomplishing what we needed to accomplish with cancer. Um, so again, the problem is that, that chemotherapeutic agents don't actually target the cancer tissue. Um, what Dr. Falk discovered uh, with, with working with hyaluronic acid is that because it has, it seems that, that cancer cells, um, even though there's a tremendous amount of naturally free circulating hyaluronic acid in our bodies, that um, cancer cells have a higher physiologic affinity or need for hyaluronic acid, and so they preferentially draw it to themselves, and it reminds me of the old, uh, you know, raid commercials. You, know, you remember the commercials, you know, where they, the bugs smell, uh, you know, the the perfume of the raid, and it's all wonderful, and they kind of come along, and then all of a sudden, bam, they get whacked. And uh, this is, you can imagine the parallel here, that um, they they're they're they draw in the hyaluronic acid. We've now coupled it with a chemotherapeutic agent. And as soon as that chemotherapeutic agent enters into the tumor cell, whether it's a free circulating tumor cell or whether it's actually a tumor mass, then bam, it knocks it out. And the, and the remarkable thing about this is that what uh, Dr. Falk discovered is that we can um, create this targeting specificity and use one-tenth the dose of the chemotherapeutic agent 
instead of the full toxic systemic dose so that we can mitigate most of the downside of these, these dangerous substances. We can stop the hair loss, the secondary uh, end organ damage, the, you know, all, all chemotherapeutic agents are carcinogenic in their own right. So, you know, you cure cancer to get cancer. You create remission only to come out of remission. It's almost a guaranteed deal. <clears throat> so, go on. So you can see, um, you know, what he identifies is, you know, 25 years of trying to get um, neoplastic diseases um, treatable with drugs, you know, is, is, isn't working. Um, and, and the problem is because um, uh, tumor cells basically, you know, the, the, there's their anaerobic metabolism, abnormal vascularization going on, so not enough of the tumors affected, so you have to keep using higher and higher doses of these toxic substances um, to no prevail. So go on. So essentially this is a diagram simply showing um, that in the central core of the tumor that we have an area of little or no blood flow. Um, and it's, so it's very hard to get these agents into, into the tumor tissue. Go on. And then here we're looking at the molecule of hyaluronic acid. As again, you can see it's a glucosamine combined with a glucuronic acid. So basically it's a disaccharide. Um, and um, what's interesting is that uh, what Dr. Falk discovered is that if you take hyaluronic acid and chemically bond it to the um, hyaluronic, it in fact um, changes the structure of the hyaluronic acid so that it will not target the tumor specific or free floating cancer cells. That we actually have to take hyaluronic acid and mix it as a simple admixture uh, with whatever uh, cofactor, whatever chemotherapeutic agent or non chemotherapeutic agent we're going to use here. You cannot actually. Um, uh, you know, bind it um, chemically and, and get the results. So, um, it's, I mean, essentially it's, you know, literally all we're doing is, is, is mixing a liquid solution of, of the low molecular weight hyaluronic acid versus trying to induce, um, you know, a chemical bonding of the molecules of the chemotherapeutic agent. So what is hydrogen? What? What is the AM and AM? Is that different from hyaluronic acid? It isn't. It isn't. It's the polymer, the large polymer, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the simple polymer. Yeah. So it polymerizes. Right. In small. In a small molecular weight, right. So. Um, you know, in the pathologic state, hyaluronic acid appears to be lost to the site of pathophysiology. So this is where we're saying that um, even though there's a, a lot of endogenous hyaluronic acid, um, it doesn't it doesn't matter when we when we when we combine the hyaluronic acid um, in an exogenous form parenterally, it will target those pathologic sites, and that's been seen consistently. Um, one of the things that Dr. Falk did is, you know, tried to assess, um, you know, what's happening with hyaluronic acid. This is a this is a model basically with liver transplant patients. You know that um, we essentially get, um, you know, organ allograft rejection, and one of the common drugs used to minimize that is cyclosporine, which is a very potent immunosuppressant drug, also extremely toxic, um, and uh, what um, Dr. Falk discovered is that if you take the cyclosporin, mix it with a small amount of the hyaluronic acid, reduce the dose of the cyclosporin, that we get a longer survival rate with patients than if you are simply using cyclosporin alone. Because again, there seems to be this potentiation property. So this is occurring regardless of what the clinical application might be, that hyaluronic acid, whatever we combine it with, seems to be targeting and potentiating the influence of that substance. Um, and one of the areas that we use it extensively with 
is chelation therapy. So you're all familiar with the use of EDTA as an agent for um, uh, taking arteriosclerotic plaque and, and binding, dissolving it, and, and all the other components that EDTA biochemically is involved in. But if, if we mix hyaluronic acid into that, uh, what I've seen clinically is that we can uh, get, we get quicker results, better results, less treatments uh, to get the job done. <clears throat> so basically this is just identifying that in a situation where <clears throat> the hyaluronic acid was added to cyclosporine, 80% long-term survival versus cyclosporine alone in, in the liver transplant patients. <coughs> what was in the in the non hyaluronic group compared to what? Was it eighty percent improved? Eighty percent improved. Oh, okay. One point right. Yeah. 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 Um, right. So um, part of the 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 uh, consideration of why this may be the case is it seems that hyaluronic acid in particular, it tracks through the lymphatic system. And it's interesting, we know that, of course, most cancers have an unusual affinity for like, lodging in and then tracking through the lymphatic system. So if we have something that, in particular, additionally tracks to the lymphatic system and is going to carry our chemotherapeutic agent at a lower dose, then we have a nice, a nice weapon at our disposal. Go on. Um, so this is a situation where uh, they treated 63 patients um, with cancer. And essentially, um, patients were given hormone blocking agents if they were positive for <coughs> progesterone. Um, and again, low dose chemotherapy with and without hyaluronic acid. And then what we see is that of the 63 patients, uh, number surviving free of cancer, 55, average survival time, eight years. So 90% survival for as long as nine years. Um, so the idea that moderate doses of chemotherapy um, with NSAIDs and hyaluronic acid have clearly improved survival rates relative to traditional um, chemotherapeutic applications. Um, the part of what we're going to lead into here, and this is something that Dr. Falk started doing, and then unfortunately, um, he had a, a brain aneurysm and we lost him overnight, um, unfortunately. But um, is, is the idea of if, if we can use hyaluronic acid and reduce the chemotherapeutic dose substantially, and a couple of the, the one of the other ways that you may be aware that, that we're doing this in an integrative model is by taking um, insulin and using insulin as a potentiator to drive the chemotherapeutic agent at a lower dose. Um, I don't have any personal clinical experience using insulin, um, but I said I have a lot of experience using the hyaluronic acid, and, and I like what I'm seeing a lot. Um, but the, the point here is, um, as you're going to see go forward, is that we're going to, we're going to jump in a moment over to vitamin C. Um, and um, I'm real excited about using vitamin C as our chemotherapeutic agent and not any of the toxic drugs at all. I mean, why should we be going there if we have a, na a natural agent that is a known chemotherapeutic agent with, without all the, the downside? So um, this is simply a reference in, in arterial disease, you know, using the hyaluronic acid in, con in conjunction with EDTA and again getting um, significant improvement in outcomes with cardiovascular patients versus not adding the hyaluronic acid in. So go on. Um, so essentially um, hyaluronic acid will target pathologic sites in various disease states. Um, we're getting enhancement overall whether we're trying to enhance an immunosuppressive agent, whether we're trying to produce uh, you know, enhance an anti-cancer agent, or whether we're trying to uh, potentiate EDTA for uh, uh, plaque. Go on. And just some references. Um, this is now moving over to vitamin C, um, and I'm referring to uh, Dr. Reardon's work. Um, so go ahead. 
Uh, we know that vitamin C is a potentially very potent chemotherapeutic agent, uh, and again, not having any of the, uh, the common side effects associated with chemotherapy. In fact, positive side benefits primarily increasing collagen production and enhancing immune function. Um, initially, in Dr. Reardon's work, what they discovered is there was a serum effect occurring that uh, reduced the ability of vitamin C to act as a toxic substance to cancer cells so that originally lower doses of vitamin C that were thought in an in vitro environment would be cytotoxic to cancer cells, they discovered because of this serum effect, were not adequate to the job. So, what do you mean by the serum effect? You talk about blood serum? Yeah, yeah. the serum doesn't get Somehow gets bound to the serum in a way that it minimizes the ability of this, this vitamin C to be cytotoxic. So, you know, it's the problem, of course, when we're doing in vitro versus in vivo, you know, does it, does it cross correlate one to one? And the truth is it really never does. It's just like doing an animal study versus a human study. You know, it's an extrapolation, but, but we can't take it as a, as a given one to one. Um, so basically what they started doing is trying to look at what level of vitamin C would be adequate to in fact be effective in an in vivo situation. <clears throat> um, hold on. And essentially what they did, established is if we're looking at um, the concentration of vitamin C milligrams per deciliter, that um, we're looking at both a dense monolayer and a sparse monolayer model of, of cancer. Um, and we're, we're basically to get, you know, 100% die off of the cancer cells at 200 milligrams per deciliter in the in the in the uh, in the sparse and then 400 in the dense this this is the concentration cellular concentration of vitamin c to be effectively uh, an effective chemotherapeutic agent what this essentially translates into is um, pushing about 60,000 milligrams 60 grams of vitamin c in an intravenous application see that by 2 hours yeah so what what he was doing is taking um, um, 60 grams, infusing it over half an hour to an hour, and then discovered that um, he the, we were losing the adequate concentration very rapidly. So he was adding 20 more grams, and then infusing that over an additional hour, and discovered that he could basically maintain, um, yeah, go ahead. He could maintain, uh, where does it say here, you know, 240 minutes. Um, by doing this 60 gram followed by 20 grams, um, and that we, we'd be holding the concentrations adequate um, to be cytotoxic to cancer cells. Um, you know, what I do clinically is I just make it a, a, a policy. I mean, he's, he's kind of developed a formula for you can take a patient and you can assess exactly what the plasma concentration of vitamin C is to be cytotoxic for that patient. And, uh, what he's de demonstrated is basically at this 60 plus gram level, you're there across the board. Um, so I use 75,000 milligrams and I do an infusion over three to four hours. So we're getting the time interval to maintain the plasma concentrations for an adequate period of time. Now, yeah. Well, now, does this mean though that this, uh this use of vitamin C now, at this point, you're not using the AHA yet, right? Right, that's right. If, if, if you do this without the AHA, and you use 60 grams, that you can actually uh, kill colon cancer? You can right. cure colon cancer? Well, um, potentially. Potentially. I mean, the, you know, one of the things I'm very cautious about, and I've been doing this for over 20 years, is, is I don't tell any patient, and again, I said this at the beginning, you know, I don't think there's a magic bullet. I don't think there's a simple cure that all we need to do is all get really clever and just take lots and lots of vitamin C and start getting prophylactic vitamin C IV and we can, you know, that's, that's the answer. It's not antibiotics. It's not gene therapy. It's vitamin C. No, I, I don't buy it. I mean, I treat a lot of chronic disease and I'm very impressed with vitamin C as a cofactor in helping uh, disease states. Um, and 
some of the clinical studies that have been done and in my own experience in my office, I've seen some very remarkable patient cases, and we're going to we're going to get to some of those in a minute. Yes, sir. Do you have to build up to that uh, to that level? No. Of the nice thing about about vitamin C in a parenteral application is because we're bypassing the GI tract, you don't have to worry about bowel tolerance. Okay. So you do not have to titrate and build the dose up as you do when we're dealing with an oral form. Okay. Cool. If that graph is correct, though, why couldn't you have someone with a bad attitude? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but, but the truth is, is we know that a bad attitude is an incredibly powerful negative feedback loop. And in fact, you know, allopathic physicians have done more studies on this than almost anything else. And it's, it's you know, the attitude of the patient. If a patient goes to their allopathic oncologist and, and they buy their story, lock, stock, and barrel, the outcome is going to be profoundly and significantly better than if they go and say, I, bullshit, no way, I don't believe it. You know, it's just a fact. So what we want, part of what we try to do clinically is really uh, educate patients. You know, really talk to them about the philosophy of naturopathic medicine, mind, body, spirit, why it really is important and why we need to kind of get on board in our belief structure connected to that. And if you can show someone, you know, a study, um, then I think that that's helpful, you know. Are these measurements cellular vitamin C levels or serum? Plasma. Plasma, okay. So do you know if there's a competitive effect with glucose and vitamin C getting into the cell and if that affects the cytotoxicity phenomenon? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not now. I'm not aware because of, of you know the work with insulin potentiation. I mean, one of the things I I've, I've started doing is is you know using um, D5W or glucose five percent glucose as as my carrier, um, based on the assumption that um, I mean cancer cells are embryologic cells. They have a very fast metabolism. They're drawing sugar and they're growing off sugar. So if we can take a small amount of sugar. We're, I think we're increasing the potentiation um, rather than just sterile water, which I used to use sterile water exclusively as my carrier. So I, I think there's something there, but is that measured document? No, That's never been documented. No. If you give a patient 60,000 milligrams of vitamin C drip, how long does that stay in the body? And the other question I'd like to ask is if you do it in 20 minutes, that high a dose, um, if you do it in 20 minutes, it's very likely that you will induce a Herxheimer reaction mm -hmm. and that you'll end up uh, inducing a fever and chills and, and, and feeling kind of miserable just because it's, it just, just blows your system out of the water. So it's very important, in my opinion, to, to infuse this over a slow period of time. And even with, in that situation, patients sometimes will still have reactions. I had a reaction, that's why I asked. Yeah. I, uh, had, I had rheumatoid arthritis, uh -huh. so I went in for the vitamin C drip, 50,000 milligrams. Right. And instead of it being pushed in me uh, within, 20, uh, or within two hours, it was done in 20 minutes. And every one of my... Every one of your joints hurt like crazy. Well, I was just, yeah. I was sitting and closed my yeah. fist. Um, I had a pounding headache. Yeah. And when I did, when it passed through me, I had burning sensation, and I was <clears throat> that way for a month until the doctor put me on high doses of prednisone. Really? Yeah. It was uh, really high doses of prednisone, high doses of prednisone, prednisone she said, to, to finally, down, yeah. It's just happened to me. Um, so, you know, I, I've seen those reactions that last for, you know, 12 to 18 hours. Mm -hmm. I have never seen it you know, be a catalyst to just kind of lock it in. So I'm, I'm wondering what else was in that solution. Well, first she, she took a pint of blood out, and right after she took the pint of blood out, she did the vitamin C drip. And then when she did the vitamin C drip, she also pushed it with, uh, I don't know how much, but quite a bit of uh, uh, glutathione. Glutathione, glutathione, yeah. Glutathione. Now, uh, so the blood was taken out, and, and I mean, we weren't, there wasn't an oxidative, there wasn't ozone or peroxide or things put in that. No, not that you know of. No, no, I, I know there wasn't because I watched the whole thing. Okay. You know, and I watched them put it in the, the uh, 
in yeah, the well, I, I mean, I, I would personally, I said, never infuse those concentrations of vitamin C in, in that short of time interval. Well, I, I'd like um, to ask one more quick question. The glutathione, is that sulfur? Yeah. Well, glutathione is a sulfur molecule, yeah. Now, see, there's my problem, too. She knew I was highly allergic. Okay, now, now, no, yeah, sulfa. A, a, well, there's a lot of people that are allergic to sulfa, which is an antibiotic. It has absolutely nothing to do with sulfur-based natural substances. A lot of people are confused, and they think they think, oh, it's like it's it's going to get me, and and it's a different animal. I've had reactions to both. Okay. Natural and both. Okay. okay. Right. And I worked a little bit with Neural Barnett on the poly MBA studies. And one of the things that Dr. Barnett told uh, us and Dr. Paul was never to use vitamin C with his program. Because he did studies with vitamin C and cancer cells and never saw any really inhibiting factors on cancer cells. But what vitamin C does well is it increases the um, hydration levels of the cells. And that's why, um, and the same thing with a lot of the cancer therapies that I've seen, they do better with low levels of vitamin C than high levels of vitamin C. Okay. okay. This is a little yeah. correction. I've never has changed his opinion. He says not to use it on the same day. Yeah. You can use for IVC on the next day. Yeah. So he never really did any full He was study. never an advocate of high dosage. Maybe more than 2,000. Because I just recently spoke with him again. He was a dentist who uh, spent his life on poly MBA. He didn't know about that. He didn't know. And, you know, it's interesting, of course, poly MBA is, is a palladium lipoic acid yeah. complex. Lipoic acid is a very potent antioxidant, and it's, it's vitamin C sparing. And, of course, what, uh, you know, Reardon um, established is that the addition of lipoic acid in vitamin C it creates a tremendous potentiation, so you can even use less C. Another so, thing that he did a study was he showed that hyaluronic acid is a key communicator of cells, right. essential for normal cell activity. Right. And that uh, nicotine and, and uh, nickel and cadmium uh, were the principal causes of uh, hyaluronic damage. Uh -huh. And so he, uh, you know, suggested that these components. Um, get removed from the body so that, you know, hyaluronic acid can be functional. More effective, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. First of all, was the vitamin C that you administered IV, was it the free acid or was it buffered in some way? Uh, in, in these, in, in Reardon's work, they're using a sodium ascorbate. Um, and in the work that I do, I use a non-corn-based ascorbate uh, well, ascorbic acid, and then and then I'm adding um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and and sodium bicarb as my buffering agents to my solution. But I am not using the commercial sodium ascorbate products. I am not aware that any of the commercial sodium ascorbate products um, are not the corn source. Well, what's, I mean, what's the uh, what's the pH uh, of the uh, well, they're, they're running this between about 6.5 and 7. And there is uh, evidence that, of course, if you, if you uh, as Burns said, if you uh, administer it too fast, you get the concentration up too much, and you get things too reducing because it's been speculated that the way that the cancer cells uh, are killed by vitamin C is that they're more oxidizing than normal cells, and they turn it... They turn the vitamin C into dehydroascorbate, which is actually the toxic agent that kills the cells. So if you make things too reducing, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, it definitely needs to be infused over a longer period. Now, I get a couple of physicians every month who call me about having using vitamin C intravenously. First, I want to say, if you make, if you add sodium ascorbate to water, uh, you come out with a pH of 7.4 every time, which is an interesting coincidence. Mm. But the other thing is that I find that a lot of physicians, when they get an IV into a patient, they can't resist putting other things into it. And the most common thing that I find where they seem to have trouble is when they add glutathione. Don't ask me why, 
but there seems to be a number of people who have trouble when you add glutathione to vitamin C. So that that what's happening? You're saying that, for example, some of the Herxheimer reactions or things might be induced because of that combination. Could be. I don't know why it is. You know, because I routinely add glutathione, and it, and I have I have had people question me about that and say that they're you know. I, you know, in my mind, it seems like it should be potentiating and that it's a prudent thing, and yet some have said, no, it's, it's not. So I'm, I'm curious. I see highly allergic patients all the time. Yeah. And um, I don't think that anybody is allergic to a 100% pure or anything that we've been talking about. The trouble is there's no such thing. Mm. And so then how is it made? What are the additives? What are the chemicals used in producing the glutathione? Now, I'm just saying that I've had a number of physicians say they had trouble. Now, maybe they're using a different brand than you. Yeah. Uh, that's, that, I don't want to belabor that, but there's some inter you're bringing up some interesting points in the way the glutathione is made at the manufacturer. The pH, the stability of glutathione uh, it can become oxidized when put into solutions. In different sources, you may be actually giving some oxidized glutathione depending on where it's coming from unless the simple way to do is inquire if they've tested their product to see if it's stable before they ship it out. Because most of it's made in a compounding pharmacy, um, not all of them do the same processes. So glutathione can have a wide range of variability in its in product and so it, all glutathione gets knocked around because of that. Yeah, that's actually it's a good point. Um, it, it, a lot of these products, as you say, are made from compounding pharmacies and uh, and I've had that experience specifically with glutathione where um, I've actually had some batches recalled because they were contaminated and causing problems and then we didn't have access to glutathione intravenously actually for it seemed to me there was a six to nine month window where I couldn't get any from any source and then they claimed that they solved the problem and it's been fine ever since, as far as I know. Do you know if the um, water solutions are degassed before they're used? Because there is a fair oxygen concentration that can be found in a, in a, in a water where it could oxidize the glutathione when it's mixed. And that may not happen to vitamin C because vitamin C would be a two electron oxidation reduction and the glutathione might be just a one electron oxidation so it might be more sensitive and might therefore uh, it might be necessary to use reduced water or to degas the water first to keep it from reacting. So, so that's a good question and I don't know the standard um, you know bottles that we get of, of sterile water from the pharmaceutical companies are they does anyone know are they degassed or not or do we know? So. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there is such an enormous amount of extra, extra electrons in 60 grams of ascorbate that I think it can practically reduce anything. Now, the theory has been that if you give ascorbate, and I think this might happen in small doses, where the free radicals generated by the disease process or whatever would cause the hydroascorbate. Now, but I've seen no evidence that the massive doses we do ever let that happen because there's a redox couple of ascorbate over dehydroascorbate and as long as you're willing to feed in more ascorbate constantly, you always keep that redox couple reducing. Right. That makes it makes sense. Again, it's you know, it's concentration. You know, when you start reducing this kind of concentration you kind of overwhelm. Yeah. That's the point. I want to be sure that you understand you can postpone questions anytime you like. Yeah. In order to go All right. Yeah. Now they're all right. It's going to get us caught up. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we, went to, we covered this piece. This is, um, <laughs> so, essentially, this is looking at. Um, you know, looking at between 15 up to 65 grams of ascorbate infused over time. Again, just identifying plasma concentrations. Um, and, you know, again, we've got to start pushing the higher, the higher levels to drive it at the 200 plus, you know, to hold it and sustain it um, above the 200 level. Um, we've got to basically you know, go into the, uh, the, the higher concentrations, the 65, 60 gram levels rather than the 15, 30s. Where's the 15? So we're looking at, at 
at um, yeah, I see this is this one's third. I think I don't even know that 15 is. I think it's it drops off the bottom. It's not even doesn't even represent on the chart. Um, so basically, 97% cytotoxicity. Um, these are now. This is this is time. So 35, 65, 95 minutes um, after infusions that are maintaining adequate concentrations, we're getting that level of active tox cytotoxicity of the cancer cells. Um, go on. And essentially, again, so this is simply showing it graphically that 35 minutes, 65, 95 minutes, there's ver almost 100% um, the killing of cancer cells. Once we start going into time past that, you know, we're, we're losing, losing the influence. Um, so, you know, one of the things, of course, that would be is curious to me, and I've never had an opportunity to do this, and I'd love to see somebody do this clinical work is to take someone and put them on a 24-hour pump, someone with cancer, put them on a 24-hour pump of vitamin C, what could happen then versus we have patients coming in twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, um, and those pumps are expensive, and the medicine starts to get expensive, but um, we need somebody, we need a, an angel out there with big bucks to give us a grant to to uh, do some of this work to really find out what's happening. Next. Um, so basically, this is you know where uh, uh, Reardon discovered that by adding lipoic acid, that he could create uh, potentiation of the vitamin C and um, would get 50% uh, cancer cell die off um, by reducing. Um, rather than, than having to you know, pushing 700 milligrams per decade down to 120. Substantial reduction in the amount of vitamin C to maintain adequate concentrations. Um, um, and so I've been, again, um, I don't have the equipment to do the, the testing to demonstrate, for example, my, part of my belief in what I've been doing clinically is rather than merely adding lipoic acid, I'm adding glutathione. Now, now maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm adding glutathione. Um, again, we're going to show some cases here, and some of the results are quite dramatic. So um, I might be doing something that's that's exceptional, and at the same time even undermining it. Um, but um, you know, I'm looking at I'm looking at what's happening in a, in a real clinical setting. Do you happen to know whether or not lipoic acid is reduced by the vitamin C or not? Anybody ever measured that? I don't know. I don't know. Does anyone know? Okay, go on. Um, so basically, um, you know, one of the considerations relative to uh, you know vitamin C is is the simple fact, of course, that vitamin C is potentiating collagen induction, and so. Um, there's been some speculation that the reason vitamin C is is helpful and that even lower doses of vitamin C may in fact be useful not rather than higher but simply <coughs> why they do something is because they're inducing collagen and therefore um, it's it's reducing cancer cell induction of collagenase and, and the hyaluronic acid reducing hyaluronidase um, and we're basically if you will, it's by inducing collagen, it's like we're, we're creating um, uh, increased uh, cross-linking of collagen. This is a positive thing. This is, you know, imagine, if you will, that, uh, you know, collagen is like a fine woven fabric, and if it's a really tight fabric, then these cancer cells can't break through the membranes to then take over additional cells. So in essence, what we're doing is we start walling off and isolating the tumors and the cancer cells from free circulation. Um, uh, and, and I think there's definitely something to that. I think that both things are occurring. I think that high doses of vitamin C are both cytotoxic to cancer cells and they're inducing massive amounts of collagen induction. And at the same time, um, low doses are still inducing collagen, so it still exerts a protective influence. So the, the, the axiom that we should all be taking vitamin C uh, orally, of course, is a gift. I mean, that's just uh, 
common sense. And they're, so well, they're, they're talking about you know oral levels two to four milligrams per deciliter is 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 significantly inducing collagen. I mean, what I tell uh, patients is I want everyone taking you know a thousand milligrams three times a day, and as just as a matter of prophylaxis. And of course, if you have a, have a cold or a flu or anything else is going on, then you want to in, in titrate vitamin C to bowel tolerance, which, as Dr. Cathcart would tell you, uh, when you have an active infection, you'd be amazed how quickly you can titrate really large doses really quickly and not have diarrhea. It's like there's some very remarkable physiologic phenomenon that happens that when you don't have the infection, if you try to titrate that C up, you're going to be really hard pressed to do it, at least quickly. You can do it slowly, but you can't do it quickly. <laughs> yeah, lysine? Um, not routinely, no. In lysine into the IVs? Lysine no, orally? Or whatever, to help the, as part of the collagen production stimulation? No. Uh, no, I don't have it. Wow. You know, I mean, the, you know, what starts to happen, and you're going to see when we get to the point where I start to kind of show you some protocol, uh, treatment protocol, is, you know, I mean, I kind of what I do is throw out the kitchen sink. You know, how much do we need to use, both orally or intravenously, of something to get the, the end product? And as this stuff starts to cost money. So, um, uh, you know, and, and I don't know what the answer is. I don't know where the cutoff, you know, really needs to be. What I know is um, I tend to, you know, use more rather than less if we have patient compliance and tolerance, and I think that that the outcomes are better. Um, but the, the truth is, is there's, you know, uh, so many, literally dozens to dozens of things that you can keep adding to treat whatever you have that we all become overwhelmed and, and you just can't comply. Um, go on. Um, so basically, and specifically with prostate cancer, um, what's generally been found is that even the high doses of vitamin C don't seem to be adequate to break um, the uh, prostate cancer. And this talks about how um, even at 300 milligrams per deciliter that the live cancer cells um, were simply locked to the flask and that they had to use incredibly high doses of trypsin EDTA to break it away and even we're talking about physically like chipping these cells um, and yet the, the, the clinical experience that often with high dose vitamin C that uh, prostate cancer patients are still living longer than without it but there, there isn't necessarily the evidence that it's in fact stopping the cancer, but possibly that in fact it's walling or isolating the cancer, so there might be quite a bit of tumor load in a, in a prostate cancer patient, but that it's not going to get anywhere. So um, what I've experienced though with the addition of the hyaluronic acid is that it seems to be breaking through this barrier, um, and that's what I think is the exciting uh, admixture of the two. That, that's potentiating. So let me just keep going on and not answer questions at the moment. Um, so, you know, this idea of the tumor cells being glued in place because of, of collagen induction, I think, is, is a really uh, interesting concept. Go on. So you're saying that the cancer cells are producing collagen? No. The cancer cells are producing collagenase so that they can... Which tries to break down the collagen. Which tries to break down the collagen so that they can then spread from cell to cell more rapidly. So yeah. by building up? By building up the collagen, we're locking them in place. And they can't, they can't produce enough collagenase to overwhelm it. This is a bad theory. This, that's why Rath says you should use lysine because the collagenase will just latch onto the lysine. Forget the collagen. It just goes right to the lysine. And they can't get out the collagen. Okay. Even better than that is you which is a phenolic compound from green tea and microstructured water, reduced water at a negative 800 ORP, they're reversing cancer at the University of Duke. So neat. Could yes. be a hydration effect like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, and then this is basically just simply looking at, at toxicity parameters of vitamin C. And of course, what's been demonstrated from a variety of sources that, is that vitamin C has little to no toxicity in, in just massive doses and, and versus a chemotherapeutic agent. And you know, why isn't it being taught and or used uni universally by allopathic physicians? And I think the answer to that was alluded to when I came into the room and there was a gentleman speaking about um, some of the problems with, with modern medicine and the pharmaceutical industry and the, the, the power structure that keeps feeding um, the use of, you know, anyone who is at um, the Cancer Control Society talk, uh, anyone who's not familiar with Ralph Moss, you know, I encourage looking at his website. Ralph is a consummate researcher who looks at the documentation to substantiate uh, traditional versus alternative therapies and the amount of research that, that has been done and the hue and cry of allopathic medicine that, you know, we have no research in alternative medicine and there's no studies. Um, is nonsense. I mean, we don't have as many studies as we'd like, we but we do. Yeah, we can't see it. Wherever it is, it's not there, so we don't believe it because nobody told us. You, you know, you've, you've all heard, you know, the, the story of, uh, you know, the president of, you know, Harvard Medical School. He's addressing the graduating class, and he says, you know, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that we're confident that 50% of everything we've taught you in your years of medical school is correct. The bad news is we're not sure what 50%. The, the problem is in medicine, we get fixated and start to believe that what we've been taught is the truth. Um, and sadly, it's not. And, and, and part of the truth that's very important for us to recognize is that the scientific method, as we practice it in modern science, and particularly in medicine, in medicine more than hard science, but in medicine, it is a deeply and profoundly flawed system. It's flawed because the concept that you can take a single variable and apply it to a single condition in a thousand patients who are all unique human beings, all eating and living and being different, is ridiculous. And yet they're fixated that this is the only way you can get legitimate data. It's not. And we, we have to break through that barrier somewhere here. It's, it might, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it doesn't say how, it doesn't say how many, and uh, uh, do you ever get uh, in any of your patients who get the high hyaluronic acid uh, any symptoms of rheumatic fever? Because it's bacteria, uh, of course, especially in children who get sore throat uh, with staph that have high hyaluronic acid in their cell coat that later, if they're not treated properly, uh, they get these symptoms of rheumatic fever. And I'm wondering you know, if you've uh, seen I, any of that. I, I, I've not seen any of that. Um, <clears throat> hyaluronic acid um, definitely is, is a very well-known common pyrogenic <coughs> substance um, that if it is not purified and prepared properly, that it's, it's downright, uh, I, mean, it's, it, I don't know how dangerous it is, but boy, will it make you sick. And I, and I can tell you at one point in my clinical experience that I was, I, I mean, consistently I get my hyaluronic acid from um, one of the gentlemen that was making the hyaluronic acid for uh, Dr. Falk and continues to make it for Dr. George Zabrecki, who's kind of taken over his work. Um, and um, I, I broke away from him and went to my local compounding pharmacist and said, why don't you make this for me because, you know, I'd like to give you the business, you're a good guy. And I said, now, you need to understand this stuff is pyrogenic. You've got to tell me confidently that you are capable of making this pyrogen free. And he said, don't worry, I got you covered. And he did not have me covered. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I just, uh, so I don't know if that correlates specifically to any of the rheumatic symptoms you're referring to possibly. But um, I definitely, you definitely want to be careful about where you're getting the stuff if you're going to inject it into somebody. Yeah. Uh, it's at the end of the end of it. One. Um, so basically, um, some uh, case studies: 70-year-old um, male with uh, adenocarcinoma, right kidney, had an nephrectomy. Uh, develop metastatic lesions to the liver and the lung. And any of you who work with cancer know that when cancer in particular 
goes to the liver. You know, it's usually just a downhill fall, and it's it's the end of the deal. Um, and basically, uh, started intravenous vitamin C, 30 grams twice a week. Um, you know, feeling well, metastases shrinking. 15 months after initial therapy, the oncologist reported um, no signs of any cancer progression, and this patient lived 14 years. This is one of the, the first few um, case studies are out of Dr. Reardon's work, um, so uh, they're not my cases, but I think they're they're interesting as in point. Um, here's a patient. Um, uh, it was a patient with uh, colorectal cancer, and, and one gentleman had asked, you know, can we use the vitamin C to cure <laughs> colorectal cancer? Um, this is interesting. In this case, uh, the patient, of course, uh, was told by his oncologist, as many of you may have experienced, you know, doctor, is there an alternative? Is there anything I could possibly do other than, you know, cut and burn and poison? And they say with a straight face, looking you square in the eyes, Absolutely not. There's nothing else you can do. And as you're probably well aware, um, there's been, in the last uh, few years, there have been a few studies, uh, very poorly done, um, intimating that vitamin C is dangerous, even in small concentrations, and we should all refrain from taking it. And of course, you're all aware, and more recently now, there's a study about vitamin E being dangerous, and we should all stop that. And to be honest with you, I think it's, it's a reflection of the allopathic community starting to be afraid of the of the power that we're starting to generate in educating people and so it's kind of like they're struggling to say no but we were right all along we were right let's let's show you because for their two bogus studies we can show you a thousand studies of why vitamin c is beneficial and why vitamin e is beneficial and and a, and a particularly important point um, and there's one case that we're going to uh, kind of might even be this case. Um, in my experience, if we have a patient that chooses traditional therapy, they're choosing chemotherapy or radiation, and we can currently give high dose IV vitamin C, that we significantly reduce the side effects, we significantly reduce the long term negative sequelae associated with these toxic substances, and we actually increase and potentiate the efficacy of the chemotherapeutic agent with the patient. So, so this idea that's being, being proposed that when you do your chemo, under no circumstances take antioxidants, that you need to, if you're going to do it at all, you need to wait, um, I want to suggest is wrong. That we need to be taking them at the same time and that the outcomes are going to be better doing it at the same time. Yes, sir? Uh, are these two cases with or without hyaluronic acid? They're, these are not. These are no, not. these are not. These are just straight vitamin C. Uh, and so basically, if you notice here, what happened is his CA199, right? He starts chemotherapy. His CA199, so the oncogene comes down. At this point, um, he, he stops Actually, I think it, if, if he, if he didn't stop the chemotherapy. What happened is he continued the chemotherapy, um, and and it basically started um, he, he started relapsing. CA199 starts climbing up. Right here starts intravenous vitamin C, and you can see that that um, you know the CA199 drops dramatically with the combination chemotherapy vitamin C. Here he stops the chemo, here he stops the vitamin C, um, the patient actually um, um, died um, fairly shortly after this, at this level. But the, you know, the thing that's remarkable here, and, and clinically I've seen this so often in my case, in, in, with my patients where, again, if we're combining chemo and C, that, that the both both um, subjective and objective parameters improve with patients versus doing merely one or the other. So it's, I'm just, I'm offended and, and shocked that doctors are telling patients, you know, under no circumstances do these natural things. Let's go on. Um, so here's a 68 year old woman, um, you know, latest bone scan, metastases to nearly every bone in her skeleton. Um, so end stage breast cancer. 
and uh, develop blood, blood clots, develop cellulitis, um, and so started intravenous vitamin C 30 grams per day, increased to 100 grams per day, infused over a five hour interval. Within a week, I began walking the halls of the hospital, cellulitis cleared, discharged from the hospital, received 100 gram vitamin C three times a week, three months after, bone scan revealed complete resolution of several skull metastases, and then six months after that, she fell. She's 68 years old, complications um, from breaking her hip and died, but not because of cancer. Uh, next. I think I read this on a website somewhere. Maybe, maybe, and this is, so, uh, go on. So essentially, you know, vitamin C toxic to tumor cells, concentrations that kill uh, tumor cells can be achieved, you know, intravenously. Um, and then, as I said, the fast versus slow, what I do is it's a continuous slow infusion and we mitigate some of the complications. Um, and of course, we can predict plasma concentrations if we wanted to, but in my experience, 75 grams and up covers, covers the spectrum. If we add lipoic acid or other cofactors, we're going to potentiate it, conceivably be able to use less vitamin C. Currently, I'm not willing to do that because I don't have the studies or the ability to assess this to say, you know, I'm willing to risk my patient's clinical outcomes to, you know, reduce the vitamin C. I'm going to keep them at 75 grams. Go, go on. <clears throat> and then, um, obviously, um, we know that even oral levels increase collagen production and that that locks tumor cells in place and, um, and that even 50 grams and higher is not toxic and that some patients still have remissions or stabilization uh, you know, well with high doses or even at lower doses we think because of other um, concomitant um, cofactors like the uh, collagen induction. Go on. Go on. So this is just some references from this study. Back, back up, back up from it. So this is, uh, this is one of my patients, so a melanoma prostate cancer patient this is where now I'm using the high dose vitamin C, but I'm also adding the hyaluronic acid. And until I started adding the hyaluronic acid, um, I had never seen a prostate cancer patient do what happened with this gentleman. We have, um, if you, right here we can see his PSA is at 471. And the next, and so we're looking at 11 of 99, so the next slide. Um, what happened? It's still, still the same. Still the same. What, what happened to this? Some more. It got messed up. Um, so basically, um, you know, what, what we're looking at here is, you know, at the beginning, I mean, there was interval enlargement, right common iliac, adenopathy, um, and um, so basically, this, the disease is spreading. This is metastatic. It's not merely confined to the prostate. Uh, go on. To the, you can just stop, jump. So that, that's actually the, that zone just magnified. I don't know why it's, oh, man. I don't know why it's doing that. <laughs> that was magnifying it on purpose. Go back to this. Um, so, yeah, so, okay, so there, there we go. So, interval enlargement, and then what happened is we went, it, it, we, he had not been treated. Um, before we started treatment, you could see that he actually, the PSA went up to 702. I don't know if you, any of you caught. From 471 up to 702, we started over a period of three months of doing infusions four times a week initially of the high-dose vitamin C with hyaluronic acid. We dropped it down to. Um, this is where we want to be here. That that's fine. Yeah. So we're seeing the interval enlargement. Um, so 3.0, 2.5 up to 5 times 4.2, and then this 3.5, 3.5 goes. Uh, let's see. That's new, and then there's a new node 7.0 millimeters. So that's all you know, new stuff. Metastasizing. Go on. Um, so I said here, you know, a couple months later, he, his PSA has gone up to 702. He, we're losing ground fast on this guy. Um, this is 
where we really kind of hit the, the big guns on him and started um, infusing much higher concentration much more frequently. Um, so go on. And what happened, just it'll go to the next slide, it magnifies this. So interval decrease in the common iliac lymph nodes um, and no other abdominal lymph adenopathies identified anymore at this point. We're up to two of OO from 12. So this is two months down the road. And the three to three right common iliac lymph node demonstrates an interval decrease in size since the prior exam. And there's no other mesenteric or retroperitoneal lymph adenopathy at that time. Go on. And see, now we're down at two of OO to 13.0 on the PSA. So go on. So there it is, 13.0. And then we see the impression, this is so the CT's interval resolution of the multiple pelvic, pelvic lesions, interval uh, near resolution, right iliac nodes, and uh, abdomen, pelvis, compared to prior been interval resolution of multiple pelvic lesions. So basically, pretty much a clean shot. And now, you go to the next one, it magnifies this. We've got a PSA 1.7. Um, so, I mean, I've been doing vitamin C for years up to this point, and, having, and, and still having good outcomes with prostate cancer patients and, and improved longevity, but not seeing this kind of response ever <coughs> until I started adding the hyaluronic acid. Um, so this is another case of mine, 73 year old with uh, prostate cancer from seven years ago. Um, so the patient on his own was administering, you know, diet and supplements. Um, March of 04 PSA was at 27. Bone scans showed um, areas of uptake in the frontal bone of the skull. And we started, at this point he's come to me, we start the, the metabolic therapy with the HA and high dose C, 315 of 04, repeat bone scan in June, completely clear, PSA maintained in a range between 0.7 and 2.7 from 27. And when the PSA went to 2.7, we discovered that he was, on, somewhere he got from another doctor some, um, steroid that he was applying topically on his hemorrhoids and he mentioned it to me and I said what you know don't do that stop cease and desist and as soon as he stopped that um, the PSA came back down to the 0.7 to 1 range so what was the protocol in that case so you're you're going to we're going to yeah we're going to get there um, these are all HA yeah they're, these are all with HA so here we've got 61 year old and you can see PSA set 20, stage A3 grade 6, did conservative diet lifestyle herbal approach um, by in a month his PSA is up to 21.5. We're losing ground um, by 12.3 it's up to 23.4. So in January um, he, he went and got a biopsy, showed two lymph nodes mm -hmm. positive for metastatic adenocarcinoma. Um, extensive perineural invasion, bilateral capture penetration. So Gleason was 3-3 with focal of areas of 4 and uh, graded T3CN1. So basically this thing's broken through the capsule, it's gone into the seminal vesicles. This is not a good scene. Um, and, and a conservative approach, which is a great ideologic concept. I mean, and I've read the books and stories myself of people who, you know, went on wheatgrass juice and fasted and did colonics and their cancer was cured. But I have never in 20 years of clinical practice seen one in, in real life. I mean, and I'm a naturopathic physician and I wish I could tell you that, that it happened. But I, I don't know about it because it just, it doesn't, I mean, I think cancer is too virulent these days to be, for that to be working. Um, and so we did, the, you know, an aggressive program at two per week, and his PSA is 0.1, and no other biopsies or CTs have been done at this point. This is a current patient, but he seems to be symptom-free, doing well, and everything looks good, and at some point soon, we're gonna have some follow-up CTs and see if anything shows up. Go on. Um, this, is, this I threw in, this is a case of a, a, a male with uh, you know, coronary artery disease, and, um, and basically doing 
uh, the HAEDTA solution. Now, this is an older patient where I was, uh, many of you are aware that there's kind of a revision for some of us with EDTA protocol that rather than using the 500 ml large bottles and the sodium EDTA in a three hour plus infusion, we're switching to calcium EDTA and doing it as a, as a push or I'm doing it as just a 15 minute drip. And as far as I can tell, it's every bit as good or maybe even better than the old way and everybody sure likes it a lot more and it sure is a lot easier to use. Uh, but one of the things I do in my office is OPG or oculopathomography, which is a simple non-invasive way of assessing carotid stenosis. So it's kind of an elegant technology where we look at the um, pulse pressure differential on the eye because the terminal branch of the um, internal carotid arteries, the ophthalmic artery. And so what happens as the heart beats, it's actually driving a pulse that should be perfectly symmetrical um, as far as the pulse pressure on the eye. And what happens is if that pulse pressure is off, we can translate that into a percentage of blockage. Um, so it's a much, I think it's much more accurate than Doppler because Doppler is giving us data from here to here. And what happens if you have, have stenosis or blocking above the bifurcation or deeper into the internal carotid arterial system, you're not going to pick it up unless you do um, CAT scan or, which is for, you know, kind of expensive and invasive, or you do plethmography. So in this case, 76% blockage, um, and we did, we titrated up the traditional old chelation style, adding the 5 cc's of the sodium hyaluronate. After 10 treatments, the blockage was at 50%, and then after 20 more treatments, it was at 21%. And um, epidemiologically, in, in plethmography, when we're getting a 20% mark, we believe what we're doing is we're looking at the natural elasticity of the blood vessel, so that we're looking at essentially a normal condition. If I repeated that test an hour later, it might be 10. If I did it an hour later, it might be 17, because we're looking at natural elasticity. Um, but I do a lot of chelation therapy, and since I've added hyaluronic acid, I will tell you, I give my patients the choice. I talk to them about hyaluronic acid, and I say, look, we're doing EDTA. I recommend it. It's up to you. Um, but I've never had a patient that we've done it to that ever said, I want to go back to not adding it. Um, everybody seems to improve faster, and we can get away with less therapy overall. Um, and then this was a patient with uh, infiltrating ductal carcinoma um, and, and had a positive AMOS. I don't know if anyone has an opinion about those. It's something I, I, I run. It's an, an antibody assay for cancer markers. Um, and, but, you know, we did an aggressive protocol, and um, two months after that, pets were negative and, and lymph nodes were all negative. And this patient's been doing doing great, but it was, this was a fairly early simple cancer, but um, if you're not aware of it, you know, breast cancer has, be, has been getting more and more virulent. It's not the easy cancer that it used to be decades ago when you could do a lumpectomy or a mastectomy and you could kind of then let a woman go home and she'd still live her out her natural life. It's not happening anymore, folks. Um, so you got to watch this stuff go on. Uh, so basically, this is kind of a little little um, form I use to kind of uh, talk patients real quickly through the concept of the multifactorial etiology. You know that, that our health is really it's about diet, emotion, exercise, environment, structure, genetics, pathogens, and that you know it's about all this stuff. And and um, so you know when we're just get using this kind of linear concept of okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna whap you with very high doses of vitamin C. If patients aren't going to change fundamental properties in their life, um, in my opinion, if we can get a remission, it's going to be like chemotherapy. We can get a remission until we stop the therapy and they continue on their old lifestyle patterns and it's going to come right back. So the, the essence of nature cure, um, which is not a topic for this meeting, is, is still, I think, the most fundamental uh, piece of information that we need to embrace. So go on. Uh, so, this is um, the um, kind of formulation that I've developed for using the vitamin C hyaluronic acid. So, um, you can see it, 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 pretty consistently, I'm going to 150 cc's of ascorbic acid. The stuff I'm using is 500 milligrams per cc. 
I'm using um, a non-corn based vitamin C IV solution. I'm not using, I've never used the sodium ascorbate solution, so, um, and then I add, it's a 1% sodium hyaluronate. I always put in five cc's. And then the comment about, you know, never, not mixing poly MVA. Um, um, initially, I started adding the poly MVA to this formula and I was consistently getting Herxheimer reactions and um, so the truth is, is I've really <coughs> taken the poly MV out and I'm merely adding lipoic acid in, in this pure form from a compounding pharmacy so we're not getting the palladium component um, and I suspect it might be more prudent to have that as a counterpoint um, rather than at the same time. Um, and then I do add Latril and um, I guess that, that uh, that's a no-no but I don't know any better. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then you know glutathione, and and uh, you know I consistently add glutathione, and again from a biochemical standpoint, it, it seems that the potentiation factor it, it should be a good thing, but I, I've had some people question that, and so I don't know if, if that's something we should reconsider because it's a little bit of a pricey item. Uh, I put germanium in there if there's lung cancer, pretty only. Um, there's some interesting studies out of Japan with germanium and lung cancer, and so I like to add it. And actually, I've developed a nebulizer formula where I take the hyaluronic acid, glutathione, germanium, and acetylcysteine, and I, and I have and glycerizic acid, licorice, and I have um, a lung cancer patients uh, and uh, do that. Pneumonia patients do that, have incredible results using that type of solution in a nebulizer for a lot of things. Um, and then I add enough calcium to, to be the primary buffering agent rather than sodium in the sodium ascorbate. <laughs> add a little magnesium, potassium, <clears throat> selenium, which of course you know is a well-known anti-cancer agent in its own right at high doses, zinc for immune support, a little bicarb, either to additionally buffer and or um, if you, know, you start getting an, an aggravation at the site of infusion, you need to add some more bicarb just to mitigate the, that's, um, add some methylcobalamin. You usually ask you to measure the pH. Yeah, yeah, well I don't actually measure the pH as much as I just take patient response and if they're, if it's irritating I add more bicarb. Why do you measure the pH? Yeah, well, Why do you measure the pH? Because I don't, but that's an option, yeah. Um, the, you know, B12 is an interesting molecule. I mean cancer patients are all, um, tend to go into anemic states. But B12 is a cell proliferant, and, in, and there, there's some interesting studies showing that methylcobalamin, the methyl form of B12, is, is an anti-cancer um, agent in its own right. So I preferentially use the methyl form and do not use either cyano or hydroxycobalamin with cancer patients. I'll do that with others. But, I mean, this is the most metabolically active form anyway and the longest, has the longest half-life, so. Do you know how stable it is in such a high ascorbic acid concentration solution? Yeah, some people of course suggest that you take some of these, the B components and do a push at the end. Or an IM injection or something. Yeah, and, and I often am doing that anyway, but but uh, that's a good question. I don't know if I'm if I'm breaking this thing yeah, down, but I... Because the is less stable vitamin C yeah. than the cyan. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, B-complex, phenethenic acid. Sometimes I use some adrenal cortical extract. Most cancer patients are pretty debilitated, of course. We're talking about physiologic, well, low levels of cortisol. And cortisol is something we need to be careful of with cancer. Um, but there's a, there is, we're talking about balance. And, and the truth is, is, is uh, most patients are pretty debilitated, and I think it's a good idea to put a little adrenal in. I, I consistently put licorice in the formulations if there's liver involvement. Again, licorice is remarkable for its ability, one, to stop viruses and also, I think, to stop cancer if, in the liver. And then I don't know if, if you folks are familiar at all with the sauna medication, some of the pleomorphic mm -hmm. meds, but these are homeopathic dilutions of um, citric acid and lactic acid. And so I kind of throw those into the IV solution. Next page. Um, this is something new. Um, and I added it in here because 
Um, if any of you are familiar with the work of uh, Dr. William Koch early in the century and uh, Dr. Georgi, um, in, independently kind of came up with this glyoxyl, which is a, um, a substance that seems to have an ability to, to stop the signaling of cancer cell induction. And uh, when I started my clinical practice over 20 years ago, I had a patient come to me that I, I'd never heard about this in school. I didn't know anything about it. Um, I ended up getting one of Dr. Koch's uh, um, long out of print textbooks and I, I got some of this medicine out of Europe and I treated a patient with um, advanced squamous cell carcinoma of the left eye. When he came to me, his eyeball was bulging out of his head. He was very frightening to look at. He'd gone to the, the oncologist and they told him that they needed to take his eye, half of his face, start radiation and chemo, and that he'd still die in 30 days anyway, but they needed to do all of that to keep him alive for the 30 days. And he came to my office and said, I'm not going there, I'm keeping my eye no matter what. And I said, look, I don't, I don't know if this is gonna work, but I just accessed this, this medicine, let's do it. And this is the only thing we used except we put him on a strict macrobiotic diet. And to this day, he has both eyes and his whole body. Um, um, he never needed any surgery and, um, you know, one of the most remarkable cases I've ever seen. I was never able to get this medicine again until the last month I went to the Cancer Control Society conference and there's a, a Dr. Tai um, from back east who claims that he is now ha and has and is making the original formulation. So part of what I'm doing now, I mean, all of my cancer patients I've said, Let's stop the vitamin C because you have to stop antioxidants with this stuff and do this protocol and then, and then integrate the vitamin C with it. If this is the real stuff, some of the outcomes are going to start to be incredible. I mean, they're already incredible with C and hyaluronic. I think they're gonna, it's going to bump it to a new level. Um, next slide. Um, you know, I use a lot of the sauna medications, and I use this using dark field microscopy, so I look at my patient's blood, and then I specifically correlate the bacterial fungal phase um, um, pathogens to the specific pleomorphic medications, which is a whole lecture into itself. But it's, it's, uh, it's an important part of, of the protocol, in my opinion. And if you, for someone who doesn't use dark field or doesn't, isn't familiar with these remedies, this is a simple, um, formulation. Of course, artemisinin is the artemisia animal, which is uh, wormwood, um, which has nothing to do with these pleomorphic medicines, but I'm consistently adding that both orally and injectably as well with my cancer patients. Uh, next slide. You know, this stuff is huge. It's really important. You know, I try to, this is, you know, what I do is I actually have patients do a seven day lifestyle diary in which they record everything they're eating, drinking, they're sleeping, all of their activity, and then we sit down over several several hour visits and basically walk them through everything they're putting in their body, their mouth, and everything they're doing and try to slowly guide them to change. But the bottom line tends to look like this with cancer patients, is get them organic, get them mostly vegan, um, start juicing, lots of water. Um, next slide. Do you know many patients who do eat meat and it ruins it? Uh, I, you know, the thing, the truth is, is that people are people, and you know, when I started my clinical practice many years ago, I'd have patients come in and say, you know, you know, I have this angina, you know, could you help me? We're going to do chelation, and we're going to change your life, and they'd look at me like I was nuts, and say, well, yeah, you're going to do chelation, but you're not going to change my life, and and I would invite those people to leave my office. I don't do that anymore. I've realized as a physician that my responsibility and obligation is to serve my patients on their terms. And I have patients that smoke a cigarette before they come in for chelation and a cigarette after they go out. And the truth is, is they're going to live longer and be healthier because of it. So who am I to tell them they can't come and get chelation? So, you know, I mean, what I, my belief is I have an obligation to educate my patients to, you know, to be the best informed patients they can be and make the best choices they can make and then support them how, at whatever level that is. But that wasn't my question. My question was, does, I mean, do you have evidence that eating animal protein actually does harm? No, I don't. I don't have any direct evidence myself. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting theory, though. Um, 
some of the oral factors and you know how much of this kind of stuff I put people on partly depends on um, you know their uh, their compliance ability and their stomachs handling ability and but the point is is we know there's you know coenzyme Q at high doses by itself very good studies showing it as a you know uh, a good cancer treatment the reduced glutathione you're probably familiar with Wolbenzyme I actually have stopped using Wolbenzyme and I've switched to Zymetol which is a, a serapeptidase um, and and I don't know yet whether I'm you know, more favorably impressed. Um, in Europe, of course, most of the studies have been done with Wolbenzyme as a proteolytic enzyme for cancer, but I don't like the formula because it's filled with a lot of junk. Using enzymes for biotics, they're excellent. I use okay. that in practice and I see yeah. how the results with Yeah. But I think, you know, that the, these proteolytic enzymes taken away from food <laughs> is, is a very important part. And rather than using, if you noticed in the earlier part of the lecture where we talked about and there was reference, for example, of using NSAIDs as a concomitant cofactor with the hyaluronic acid. And obviously, I don't advocate using NSAIDs, but I advocate using proteolytic enzymes and vitamin C and, you know, other natural uh, factors. Is the purity HA, is that hyaluronic acid? That's hyaluronic is acid. non-pyrogenic or is that just... That's a, just an oral. oral. That's an oral product. That, yeah, you don't have to worry about pyrogenicity and, and in is an oral. It, is it, Digested all the way down to individual molecules, or just partially the you, you know, it's, disaccharides. It's, it's it's not really clear, but I will tell you, using it with um, you know arthritic patients, rheumatic patients, fibromyalgia patients, um, I see some really good outcomes with this stuff taken orally. So I don't know how much of it's still being kept intact, but have enough. You ever tried loading to see if it produces any pyrogen reaction? No, I never have. No. No. Not even now that it's working and taking. Well, I'm not. No, well, I, I'm not. This isn't. This is a cancer patient. This is not an arthritis patient. I'm not doing this with an arthritis patient. Um, and then, um, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I like them to be taking just small amounts of vitamin C. If I'm doing a really mega bolus of vitamin C IV, it, 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 do you believe it's useful that they should be taken loading bowel tolerance doses orally as well? Yes. So, so maybe we need to be doing that, but I historically don't tell them to drive their oral dose up while we're doing the IV. Interestingly, you can take more ascorbic acid orally while the IV is running. Oh. And, and, but then you stop the oral about a half an hour before the IV stops and then pick it up an hour or two later. Now, this is further proof that the diarrhea is a hypertonic situation and not a metabolic mm. difficulty. Interesting. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Um, oh, it's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. You know, but one of the things that happens, of course, is, you know, I mean, I have patients that come from all over the country and they're doing these high doses of vitamin C, and then, you know, one day they get 75,000 milligrams of vitamin C IV, and then they leave. And, um, you know, you get rebound scurvy or something similar to it if you take a patient and just all of a sudden just drop their C. Um, so I found that just small amounts of oral C you know, will mitigate that and they can, they're, they're okay, but you don't, definitely don't want to leave them high and dry with vitamin C. Um, and, you know, I like adding MSM, Pygeum palmetto, if, of course, it's prostate involvement. Um, this pH max is something new. I, you know, you're, you may be familiar with um, the cesium as, as a pH, um, you know, as an alkalinizer, and this is a formulation of cesium and rubidium. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, when I've used high doses of cesium and I've played with that with patients, they tend to get sick, is my experience, and I don't like it. It's too strong. It's too strong, yeah. Also, potassium, that's why it works. It's got a, a very high level of potassium. Yeah. And the pH. So, so yeah. you know, so I kind of added that. Um, yeah, and that's the other thing. Um, I think that's the other thing. 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 You know, I've been using thymic derivatives for a long time and enjoying that. I've, I've kind of just started experimenting with this. If any of you have seen this formula, the, the research in your, from out of Europe is excellent, but the formula, excuse me, sucks. Yeah. I mean, I hate it. It's filled with more, it's like it's a regular drug admixture with all kinds of binders, fillers, and if they clean it up, I'd, I'd be a lot happier about it. Um, you know, Ace Manin, yeah. tremendous amount of research. And, you know, it's interesting in, in primarily in um, veterinary medicine, ACE men, and so the mucopolysaccharoid that comes from whole leaf of aloe vera has been used, for example, with cat leukemias and whatnot very effectively. 
There aren't a lot of uh, human studies, but um, the I, I mean, I would love to be getting you know injectable ACE men and consistently and adding that in, but I've never had it available in, in an injectable form. Um, yeah, but but in an oral form, um, you know, this is a network marketing company, but they have really stable mucopolysaccharide content, um, and so it's amazing stuff. And then the artemisinin, as I said, is the wormwood. A lot of research with Mataki D. A lot of research with you know the shiitake, Ganoderma, different uh, Chinese mushrooms, and then HA. And then, as I said, the uh, serapeptidase go on. That was the first time you talked. You know, so I'll talk about oral HA. Yeah. Should we be taking oral HA? I think I think generically people should be taking oral HA as a as a regular part of their supplement regime. I take like 60 grams of C a day. Um, yeah. Or all HA is a good idea for you. You bet. Absolutely. Um, for amount of vitamin C. Um, you don't have to take a lot. I mean, I think, it, I, you know, it's, and I'm trying to remember what the milligram amount of the product like this is, but I mean, I, I commonly advocate that the patients take like two twice a day. Um, you said support. you had great difficulty getting the HA from compounding pharmacists, and uh, how do you get it? For IV. For IV. For IV. I okay. oh, but I, I've got a source for you here in, in a couple oh, more slides. Okay. We're almost there. Um, um, you know, I make I make a, a modified Hoxy formula. It's really modified because what I've done is I've taken from my studies as a naturopathic physician, kind of um, a hodgepodge of herbs that have all been demonstrated to have anti-tumor, anti-cancer, immune modulating properties. And I, I do a lot of custom formulations. I, may, I have all of, I mean, I've got, you know, uh, 300 herbs in bulk um, in tincture form, and I mix and match formulations individually for patients. Dr. Morris, what you're yeah. doing with the IVs and injections, yeah. we, used to, we used to do that at UCLA with sports medicine. Yeah. Hyaluronic acid doesn't work as well in an oral form because it gets broken down. Right, by the, uh, exactly. It, could, it can't. You have to do an IV or injection just like you do. Oh, it can't, yeah. Get results. But yeah, not, I mean, I would never expect oral forms of hyaluronic acid to, to be an effective yeah. cofactor for a cancer patient, but it is definitely helpful yeah. for inflammatory conditions and pain syndromes and myalgic conditions. You take orally that build and make the foundation of hyaluronic acid in foods in your um, best way. <coughs> what about hyaluronic yeah, I am absolutely. I mean, I, I take it and and uh, you know mix it with uh, things like homeopathic trauma and and you know B12 and procaine and in, inject IM sub Q all over the body. You know, the Hoxie formula must be some good because uh, it's been a few years ago specifically made a felony to use the Hoxie. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, about 15 years ago, I had obviously a couple of the ladies who supposedly had pancreatic cancer, but they were good-looking, healthy people and obviously probably shills from the state, and they kept asking me, do I use the Hoxie And I yeah. refused to say it is. Right. So, you know, some of the Hoxie herbs are in that formula, but there's a lot of herbs that aren't part of Hoxie. And then... Um, you know, detoxification is huge. I mean, if, if we're doing all of this stuff and we're not having patients consume a lot of water and doing some, you know, infrared saunas and getting colonic or doing enemas, um, we load people up and they cannot handle it. So um, I'm a very strong advocate of coffee enemas. There's a couple of important naturopathic principles I want you all to take home with you if you take nothing else home this evening, and that is one, the only way any of us should ever consume coffee is rectally, not orally. <laughs> should be organic, by the way. And the other important principle you need to remember is the only way any of us should ever use white flour is topically as a poultice, never orally. Okay? Coffee has good magnesium and also raises progesterone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a very potent, uh, you know, um, cologog, and it really, I mean, it basically takes the liver and just, you know, dumps. You know that if you use organic coffee and you use non-chlorinated water, uh. that's the secret, because I know some heavy research in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's on coffee, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. But they're using non, you know, the yeah. chlorinated water. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously, I mean, 
you know, the, and, you know, the importance of, of, of you know working with the psyche and doing meditation, as you're probably all aware, um, you know, when when a patient goes to an oncologist and the oncologist has this report in front of him and he looks at you and he says, you have, and your name is attached with the word cancer, I mean, for any of you who've ever had this experience, you know what happens. I mean, you just fall right out of your chair um, uh, because we have this cultural, um, you know, belief that this is not a good sentence. That the problem is what I believe is happening, and I think medical doctors sadly don't understand this principle, um, and yet they do talk about iatrogenic disease and about placebo effects, but I think they are actively practicing black magic. When a medical doctor can sit you know, across the table and tell you, you have this, and it means the following, I mean, there's an incredible power there, and I believe they have no right to do it, and they're, they're totally out of line. I mean, I see a lot of end-stage metastatic cancer patients, and they don't just live for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. Now, some of them do, but a lot of them don't because they don't buy it. You know, they buy something different. Um, but, you know, th this piece is huge, and then using some type of energetic modalities concurrently, I think, is important. Specifically with prostate, I like to do diathermy or, or rectal heat, um, and then of course, you know, more detox stuff. You know, a lot of real interesting research with qigong. You know, Dr. Weil in Tucson is is like real huge on the, some of the um, energy Reiki stuff, and there again, a lot of good studies about this stuff. Uh, next page. Next. Diathermy is a short wave um, um, electrical current that induces heat. So um, Apothecure is one of the compounding pharmacies. I get uh, some of the things from there. You know, AMARC is the source for PolyMVA. Glycomed Research, Dr. Gerard Armand is the source that I use for the hyaluronic acid. Um, and then you can actually get Latril, but don't tell anybody. If you get it, don't admit it. Um, yeah, the problem is, is of course, just using almonds or apricot seed orally, you just, you, you know, you can't get the concentrations, and it's really intravenous application of yeah. latril that's, that's yeah. clinically yeah. effective. Yeah. Um, and then I think there's even another page of more references. Um, McGuff, you know, McGuff has both the compounding pharmacy and the regular pharmacy to get things, so the, uh, the cassava-based vitamin C rather than the corn-based vitamin C. Um, Dr. Cathcart, do you have a, an opinion or does anyone have an opinion about corn vitamin C versus the other? No difference. I mean, it's more expensive. It, it, the other's more expensive and there's, I think, a lot of hype about it. And I don't know, but, you know, I get, I, what I do is I tell patients, this stuff's more expensive. You want me to use this or C? You know, the vitamin C, I mean, the corn-based. And, and I'm not, I don't have any evidence that one's better than the other, but I give patients the option and they usually want the non-corn because somehow they've heard it, you know. Um, and uh, that's my... What's your website? That, I don't have a website. I'm a bad boy. Uh, I have, you know, my card there. Oh, over there, there's a bunch of my cards. There's also, I have a series of lecture tapes. There are patient education tapes. Um, they're cassettes and there's order forms for those and I actually brought a suitcase of them if anyone's interested and there's some clinic brochures and you've all been really patient and it's been a long night. And thank you very much. So you, you think the hyaluronic acid? Okay, thank you all for coming. And I'm sorry if it was so late, but uh, you know it's in two fingers half. So uh, here we are.